Welcome back everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to our last stream of the year. Um, mostly because, I mean, there's not much time left in the year, but I'm going to be on vacation next week, so I won't be here to stream. Um, but I'm excited to wrap up the year, and it's been a really cool year. You know, I haven't um, tweeted it out. I meant to. Uh, Twitch does, like, a... the same way... Sp I mean, Spotify, like coined this or at least popularized the whole like yearly wrap up things but now everyone does it and twitch sends one to their streamers uh but it was really cool to see like we had like nine thousand watch hours or something like that on this channel which is insane to me like i, I can't believe that um a lot of you have been coming to the channel throughout the year and supporting me and hanging out and learning android development and that means a lot so I'll definitely, I'll share the stats in case any of you are interested, but, um, yeah, it means a lot. Thank you all for being here. Um, to all of my streams where that is a deconstructed Pixel 1. Yeah. Um, my fun little wall art. I have so many more things that need to be hung behind me still. I'll get there eventually. Um, I know I'm not a real streamer because I don't have LEDs behind me, but... I put them on my Christmas wish list, so maybe next time. Um, actually, the thing I want to do with LEDs in my office is not behind me. I want to put them... I don't know why I'm pointing. You can't see this. I want to put them along the back and, like, the legs of my desk so that when I'm working, like, the desk kind of glows behind me. Only I will see it, but I will think it's cool to have that. Um, my, my brother has a desk like that. Like, he put lights back there, and I just thought that was really cool. So that's something I want to do. Yeah, let's let's jump into it. I don't really have a plan this week. Uh, who's surprised? Um, if you come to a stream with a plan, you don't. You're not usually in the right place. Every once in a while, we have a plan. Um, and I have a loose plan for tonight, which is I kind of want to just. I think I want to continue working through some of the task management stuff that we did a while back. Uh, so for those of you who are just catching up or maybe missed that last stream, let me show you what we're working on. So we're working on a task management app right now. Um, this is our home screen. This is just showing a demo list of tasks. Um, and what we started doing, not last week, but the week before, I think it was, we started working on task management, so like clicking this fab launches an add task screen. What would you like to do? When would you like to do it? And we could start typing in here, um, you know, call my mom or something, and we could pick a date, uh, but then the submit button doesn't do anything. And maybe that's, maybe we can work on sort of completing this logic, um, but I also had first and foremost, a thought on some UI here uh, for a mistake that I made in a previous stream. Um, I do have to apologize. We, uh, If you were around for the stream where we built the date picker, um, we are using a, uh, a library, Compose Material Dialogues, to launch this date picker. And this is great. The library works great. One of the issues that we had um, when we first implemented this was we realized that the material, the Compose Material Dialogues library is using the Material 2, like the material design that we've kind of had stabilized for a while now. And so, but our app is using Material 3, like the dynamic uh, coloring from Android 12. And we noticed that those two things clashed. And we thought we had a solution. And let me show you what we thought that was. Is if you're unfamiliar with theming in Compose, everything in your project goes through this base theme function. We call it this TOA theme. And what you do is you create a material theme that has like the colors you want, your typography, what should be rendered, but then by doing this, everything that sits inside your app will be colored appropriately. But if the colors are, say, referencing the old material theme, old, really referring to the stable version, but 
the the other material, um, then you're not going to get the right colors. So what we tried to do was I made basically again it's not old but like the previous version of material i made a material 2 theme that had our same color palette and then i wrapped that in our material 3 theme so the idea being everything has the same colors whether we're on material 2 or material 3 um things will just work right and that there's some truth to that uh like as I said it just there, that would kind of work. Um, but here's where it doesn't work. And it doesn't work when you consider dynamic color schemes. So and we never caught that, kinda like the same reason you might be looking at this screenshot and you might not realize it's broken here. Because the day that we tested this, I had a blue background on my phone. And it just so happens that our static theme for this app is also largely blue. And so we thought we had kind of got something working. But the problem is if I have, you know, let me go into backdrops real quick. If I have a background that is not blue, um, oops, let's set this as both just to be sure. And then I try to view this. Um, you can clearly see the color picker does not match um, the dynamic theme. So that's kind of sort of a bug. Um, I don't really know how we fix this uh, without like forking the composed material dialogues and making it support material three. But given as this is an alpha library that we're playing with, I'm not going to read too far into it. But it was just something I noticed playing around with this that I wanted to share. Um, if I knew an easy way to fix this, that would be something I would want to do today. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't really know off the top of my head. Um, some of these colors, the library allows us to overwrite, but some we cannot. Uh, so I think we might just have to wait till uh, Material 3 is a little more stable. But anyways, what we could do then is we could just continue on with our development of this screen and like start dealing with, you know, clicking the submit button, maybe being extra fancy and then going back and we would see that new task at the top of our list. Uh, so that's what I might try to do today. I've also only got like an hour and a half for tonight's stream, so it's not going to be a super long one. Um, yeah, so we'll start there. I just wanted to show the color picker thing because, like, I I couldn't believe it. It was, like, I was so excited to get this working. Um, and I thought we had done it, but I realized it was because the app theme and my dynamic theme were so close that it appeared to be working. Um, and I suppose, to clarify again, if I was not using dynamic theming, I would say that this worked. Like, if, to, you know, if I was only using my static color scheme, then yes, this would work. Uh, but the problem was in the dynamic theming. So let's take a look at our, oh, I don't have the GitHub repo open. I'm gonna pull up the GitHub repo. I think I have a issue that we can track some of this work to. Um, oops, uh, wait, there's beta projects? What is this? Built like a spreadsheet, project tables give you a live canvas to filter, sort, and group issues and pull requests. Interesting. Huh. I'm not going to play around with that right now, but I'm curious. Uh, but we've got a task management. Um, and we already did some of this. We kind of sort of implemented the use cases for um, storing, editing, deleting a task. Um, time for a library PR. I thought about it. So here's, uh, so just some more context. Let me pull up the composed material dialogues real quick and I'll 
I'll share it with you in Twitch chat if you haven't seen this. So this is a really great library um, for basically supporting certain dialogue types uh, via Jetpack Compose. So there's the core dialogues, which show you... Um, I'm busy after stream trash kit, I'm sorry. You gotta be, you gotta be quicker. I already agreed to twos with someone, but I'll let you know if it doesn't work out. Um, so we've got our core dialogues, but then we've also got like a date time picker, which is what we implemented. And I did consider making the topic of tonight's stream, uh, contributing to this, um, library and adding that. But the reason I didn't, um, it's because of the fact that Compose Material 3 is still, like, in alpha. Like, Google doesn't even call it in beta, so it's, like, very early stages. And I know that means the API is subject to change. The, there's going to be a lot of versions that come up, and I'm like, am I potentially... You know, so how do we account for that? Like, we don't want to merge that right into the core library of this. So do we make, like, a Material 3 artifact, and is it even worth it? Uh, when we could just like wait till Google's gonna support it. So I decided I'm not gonna try to change this library yet. Um, cause this is really me having to own up to implementing a like pre-release sort of tool into the project. Um, which is fine. Ultimately, if you know like what you're doing and what the consequences are. So that's why I decided not to, um, make the PR into this library. I mean, we could, I could, but like, I don't know. I, I feel like I have a lot of thoughts, but I think what I might do is track like an issue for it and see um, what they think, because it did get me thinking. In a world where you have material as it is now, and say a stable material three, um, what would a library like this do? Would they offer only one? Or would they offer both? And if the plan is to have, like, a composed Material 3 dialogues, then I guess I could still get started on this, right? And then that would, like, cover some of the legwork moving forward, but I don't really know what that would mean. Yeah, that was, that was my thoughts on that. Um, so, with that... Um, Let's talk about this add task work. So this is a brief recap of what we have so far. So we've got like our add task screen somewhere. Um, yep. That has like a view model associated with it. Um, that shows some add task content. Um, actually want to look at the view model for this first. So there is an add task use case. Um, which basically takes in a task and it returns a result unit. Because um, I want to know if I successfully added a task or not. So we could start to implement that, basically. Um, I think that's what we'll do for now. Uh, we don't really have, just a reminder, this app is, um, all the data in here is just kind of like, uh, demo data. It's not connected to any real backend or room database. So I was thinking about how we would test this, and I guess we could just keep, like, some in-memory list of tasks that we could modify. And then for, like, an individual app session, we could make sure it's working. Um, so let's, let's start there. So how do we do this? Well, there's always two parts to streams like these. Do we work on the UI component first or like the domain layer for this? And, and I think it might make sense to start with like the data and domain layers and work our way backwards. So let's start at the data layer. We've got a task list repository class that fetches tasks and then can add, delete, and mark as complete. Um, I did, okay, so 
And then with that, we have sort of a demo task list repository. So what I was thinking we could do for demo's sake here, oh, and let me make this a new branch. Um, wrong time zone, have to go to sleep. That's okay, Haku, have a great night. Um, let's start by making like our list of tasks, uh, like a mutable list of tasks here. Um, basically, going to take the same code here to map some demo tasks, and then we can just do two mutable list. Um, I'm going to keep that delay in here. That's intentional just to simulate uh, like a loading screen. And um, if you want to catch the stream later, you can always watch the recaps on YouTube, exclamation point YouTube, to get the channel link. Um, so we'll have this fetch all tasks, and then I think what we can do is when we add a task, um, hmm. I've already got a lot of thoughts on this, um, about what this would mean, but what I think I would do is say task that add, um, I'm also going to add it to the front, um, we'll add this new task. And we'll say that this was success. Okay, so that's the first part. We've got this demo task repository. Uh, again, not thinking about like actually storing this anywhere. We just got this mutable list. And when we want to add a task, we return it. Cool. So the next thing is, do we have we do have like a prod add task use case that already adds a task. Okay, so that part's already done. Nice. Our past cells were looking out for us. So, how do we actually call this? Well, now we can go back into our V model. And we've got functions for when text or input changes. We should add another one. Um, that we can say on submit button clicked. Now, one thing we're going to have to think about eventually is um, uh, input validation. And we have done that in the past for our login screen, so we can use that as inspiration, but I'm going to skip that for right now, because uh, I am one of those people who really likes the iterative development, so we're just kind of kind of go with the flow and kind of get like a happy path working. And once we know that like all the plumbing works, uh, we can clean it up and worry about error states and validation and things like that. So when we click submit, we need to take the input from our screen, this description and schedule date, and convert that into a task entity. Um, So, what do we do that? So basically we'd have like task to create. Um, and what's the fancy Kotlin way of doing this? Well, in short, we could say description will be view state dot value dot task input dot description and then schedule date. Whoops, do we not have oh our task entity does not have a scheduled date on it yet. So we'll leave that out for a moment. Um, but then we can launch a code routine, do monoscope.launch, and then we can do add task use case, task to create. We can use that. Um, and then we could like track the result, you know, when result, we could say if is result. Dot success, um, update view state to success state, um, is result that error, update view state. Uh, I wonder if we have, did we already cover those scenarios? We did, look at that. Okay, so we can say here, we're gonna 
modifier of these state. So if if it's success, we want add task view state dot completed. Otherwise, we're going to do add task view state dot submission error. Um, I guess task input will be the current task input, and then the error message. Um, did we get that from? I guess we could just hard code that for now. String text, we'll just say unable to add task. Want to clean that up in the future as well. Um, so, yeah, this is the view model logic here. Click the button, call our use case. If we're success, update the view state, error, update the view state, and then the UI component will know what to do with this information. Great, so now that we have our submit clicked, we can add that um, onto the add task content. And I guess the only thing that would be different here is like, So let's talk about this briefly. This is new. Uh, this is from, we talked about this last week when we looked at the uh, new architecture docs from Android. And we switched our navigation logic to kind of match uh, what Google recommends for handling state changes like that. So the way we did it on the login screen is we have this launched effect that triggers anytime our view state value changes. And basically what we do is we say if the view state value is completed, uh, then we're going to do some navigation. And I think that's what we would do with the add task screen as well. Um, first, we're going to need a navigator. Um, I think it's called Destinations Navigator. This is a class from uh, Raphael's Compose Destinations Library. There's a stream on this in the past. You can definitely find it on the YouTube channel. If you want to see it, let me know. I can pull up the link. Uh, that's really great. Uh, but what we could do is we could do a launched effect. Um, view state that value. And then here we could say if view state that value is add task view state that completed, then from this scenario where we're adding a task we don't really want to navigate to anything. I think we would just do pop back stack. And this should take us back to wherever we were when we launched the add task screen. So this sounds good to me. Um, let's try this. Now, I'm slightly concerned that it will not work. Um, and we'll talk about why and whether or not that means another architecture change. But let's just make sure the flow in general seems to work. And I might, we're going to run into the same sort of, I need to think about this in the streams. Every time I run this, it launches to the, um, that is a good question. Uh, I don't think, you're right, I don't think I need the coroutine scope, but that was like what was in the Google Docs and I kind of like didn't question it from there. Uh, but let me go back to their docs and look at that and see if there was a reason why. Um, okay, so we've got tasks one through 10. We're gonna add one. It probably could just be side effect. Um, Yeah, it probably could just be side effect. Okay, and we went back. So the plumbing worked, uh, but the list didn't update. Let's commit some code real quick. Um, let's talk about that one question on the launched effect thing. Um, yeah, you're right. It's well, so I think that's actually. Uh, I think that was the point, 
wasn't it? Is that like, hold on, how does launched effect? I thought launched effect like only ran once, but or like it only, hold on, how does it, let's, let's, let's read this. When launched effect enters the composition, it will launch block into the composition's coroutine context. The coroutine, oh, interesting. The coroutine will be canceled and relaunched when launched effect is recomposed with a different key. Okay, you're right. So this is relaunched every time. Uh, but isn't a side effect also launched every time? Hi, Rickon. Thanks for coming by. Isn't a side effect also relaunched every time the thing's coming? Um, hmm. But I guess you're right. Like, it's... I don't want to launch a coroutine if a side effect does what I need to do. So, we can try that. Um, right, exactly. It's just some code that runs. And especially with this if statement, it's not even complicated code because I'm short-circuiting it if it's not necessary. Okay, so let's try that out. Um, and then while I'm running this to make sure the navigation code still works, I want to talk about why our... Um, can it receive a key? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, but I don't think it needs to. Um, I mean, I don't know. Hmm. Test, test. Uh, what happened there? What did I break? Okay, hold on. I broke something by doing that. Why? Maybe if, like, one of the previous things is being... Aha, so is it because... Oh, is it because when I complete this, I'm going to go back, and then maybe it's confused because it's, like, re-rendering that side effect versus when I do the launched effect, when I navigate via a launched effect... Um, wait, no, that wasn't... It was on the add task screen that we did. Yeah, oh yeah, okay, so so I think in this screen, on the add task screen, if we do a side effect, I think it's triggering multiple times. Um because like via that like transition or whatever, multiple compositions happen. Versus here, this only happens DevMTC, thank you for the subscription. I really appreciate it. But if we use a launched effect, it's only going. This code only happens when the view state changes, and because the view state doesn't change when I recompose, like in that sort of transaction, then it doesn't have an issue. I think that's probably what's happening behind the scenes. Um. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but I guess that would... That's the only explanation I have there. Um, so let's let's roll with it. Um, and let's talk about why... Because uh, I think we could have a good conversation. Um, wait, I'm just wondering if there isn't a way to have a block of code run only when some key changed. Um, hmm. Uh, well, let's see. Are they all in this file called effects? Can you look at? Oh my god, you can have like multiple. So compose or 
Disposed effect and launched effect both have keys, but they're the only ones. Side effect does not take a key. Um, schedule effect to run when the current composition completes successfully and applies changes. Side effect can be used to apply side effects to objects managed by the composition that are not backed by snapshots so as not to leave those objects in an inconsistent state if the current composition operation fails. Effect will always be run on the composition's apply dispatcher, and appliers are never run concurrent with themselves, one another, applying changes to the composition tree or running remember observer callbacks. Side effects are always run after a remember observer callback. It runs after every recomposition to launch an ongoing task spanning potentially many recompositions. See launched effect. Um, hey, Nevercom, welcome back. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out right now, so we just worked on our, so let me show you. We're talking about our add task screen. And what we want to get to is when I add a task, I can fill some info out and then uh, hopefully I would see it on this screen, which we don't yet. Uh, and that's what we're going to get to. Uh, that's really all we've done so far is that show the add path screen and navigate back. Um, and now we're talking about our code right here to navigate. We have this launched effect, which has a key being our view state. Um, and basically whenever this key changes, it triggers a coroutine that runs this code. And now we're just having a conversation on like, is that expensive to launch a coroutine every time our view state changes when it's not always relevant? And so then we want to see like what a, another possible approach would be. Uh, we can't do a regular side effect because that runs after every recomposition, which we don't want. Um, so now we were going to look at disposable effect, um, which should be similar, but uh, where do we find it? Um, uh, where it could take a key and then something that should be run, and let's see if this gives us an example. So, okay, so I think this is what Raphael is thinking of. A side effect of composition that must run for any new unique value of key and must be reversed or cleaned up if key one changes or if the disposable effect leaves the composition. Um, a key is a value. Oh yeah, no, sorry, I should have followed up and if that was a good recap, uh, but we really haven't done that much, so it only took me a couple seconds to fill you in on where we were so far. Um, okay, so the key is a value that defines the identity, blah, blah. So this sounds right. Um, oh, but what's this note here? A disposable effect must include an undisposed clause as the final statement in its effect block. If your operation does not require disposal, it might be a side effect instead, or a launched effect if it launches a coroutine that should be managed by the composition. There is guaranteed to be one call to dispose for every call to effect. Both effect and dispose will always be run on the compositions applied. Blah, blah, blah. So this sounds like it's what we want. Um, okay. I'm also noticing that this just does like a remember. And then... Like, and that's what... Si uh, the launched effect did more or less, didn't it? Hold on, where are you at? So they basically just like remember the key and then there's some code that happens when this is called. Like, can I just put remember 
view state in my code. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. What what you just said. Um, let's try that. So if I just do remember. Why is this yelling at me? Remember calls must not return unit. Oh. Um, interesting. What do the other ones do? Okay, well, let's just try disposable effect. Type mismatch required disposable. So do I have to call on dispose? Just like that? Um. And do I have to pass anything in here? I don't think so, right? No, because I don't care what happens when this is disposed. Um, okay, so let's try this out. I'm going to put the same logic on the login screen one. So, so let's run this and see how this goes. Okay, that navigation seemed to work fine. Meet. That worked fine. Our keyboard doesn't close. Um, I don't know why. But, no, that seemed to work fine. No, it's not a waste of time. It's a learning exercise, and that means something. Uh, so, never a waste of time. I love going on little adventures on these streams to try to understand a piece of code. So, I guess this is... I don't know if this is better. Like, this isn't something that really needs to be, like, disposed of. Like, I kind of just wish there was, like, a remember side effect. Um, you know what I mean? But... I wonder why I can't just use... So it says remember... returns something? What is a disposable effect result? Or is that just all it, or what it returns? Oh god, I lost where my code was. Oh, like this disposable effect impl. Oh, it's a remember observer. Interesting. Yeah, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Um that I don't think is necessary if I could just say using disposable side effect. Um, using disposable effect. Um, I'm curious though, actually with that before, well, I already committed it, but um, let's also go back to the UI events documentation from Google. Um, and see if they explain why they recommended launched effect. Um, no, because they do the same thing here for showing a snack bar. Although I think a snack bar does need to be called in a coroutine. Okay, no, there's no explanation here about why launched effect. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, maybe I'll ask the Google team, or maybe I'll ask around what the difference is between launched effect and disposable effect. But we got something working, so I'll take that part as a win. So, let's see if we can work through our task list thing. So, um, this might be obvious to some people who've been bit by this before. Why didn't this work? Right, we called this. I can probably verify that we called our use case. It called our repository. We should be using the same in-memory. Ooh, are we using the same? 
repository? Probably. Um, but why doesn't this page update? And I think the reason for that is by virtue of how our task list screen works. So when this view model launches, okay, we have this get all tasks use case and it returns a result with a list of tasks. Um, and basically what this means is it returns once. So when the screen is created, I fetch the tasks and I show what's, and then I like just return what I got back, right? Um, so the problem is it never refreshes. So we've got a couple different ways that we fix problems like that. Um, and it's not necessarily like there's a right or wrong way. It's that I don't know which one I want to do. Option one is we find some way to tell this view model that it needs to refresh the data. Um, pull a new list of tasks. That's something we could do. Option two is, well, what if we had our use case return a flow? And our use case would emit a new new um, response every time uh, the data changed. Right. Um, so, and that would be nice because then we wouldn't have to worry about refreshing. We wouldn't care who updated our tasks behind the scenes. We would just know that we will get a new emission every time that data changes. Right, the flow would work well for implementing with something like a room. Uh, and maybe a potential middle ground, I've never actually used this, but Dropbox has a library called Store. And it's all around this idea of um, data loading and caching. And it's built around coroutines and flows. Um, that I'm trying to see if I can find uh, an example. Um, yeah, I'd have to read through the whole thing. But a lot of how a store works is via flows. And so you would just get like a flow. Basically, you would see stuff like this. You would get a stream of some requests, and you would get a flow store response with some output. Um, so we could definitely change our use case to return a flow. Uh, but then I think I'm just bubbling that up. Then how do I manage my own like custom flow inside the, uh, demo repository? I don't remember. Maybe we can figure that out. Uh, so let's do one thing at a time. Let's, let's take this get all tasks. And we can leave this result, but let's get like a flow of that. So this is kind of implying that at any point it could fail. Like we could get like a flow emission and that's fine. Um, we don't have to be fancy and be like, well, what happens if there's like a deeper question of like, well, what happens if the first call succeeds and then it fails later? Do I really want to stop showing to show an error message. I'm just going to say yes. Like every time we get an emission, we'll just treat it as an individual thing. Uh, but maybe that's a potential way to clean up in the future. Um, but let's, so let's clean this up. So what I'm going to do real quick um, is I'm going to take this code that we had for dealing with a result. I'm going to pull that out into a private function really quick. And we're going to call this um, get view state for task list result. Um, this will be like a result, result list task. This will return a task list view state. And this will be all the code that we just had there. Uh, whoops. Return when result 
Uh, oh god. Fix the formatting here. There we go. So we can get rid of this line. And then, actually, what we would do here is... Our init block would look a little different now. Uh, oops, resolve that. We would basically say, um, get all task use case uh, dot on each um, view state that value equals get view state. Um, and then basically for that result, and then launch in view model scope. The spend function and oh this wait hmm so I guess if um I guess if we're returning a flow this particular function does not need to be suspending anymore um because the flow collection needs to happen in a coroutine and we can do that so we can get rid of the suspend modifier in here and we can just have this return here. Okay, so that looks good. Um, that's the view model update here. Uh, the next part is updating our prod use case. So that's still not bad um, because what I think we would do is um, I think what we would do is just have the repository also return a flow. The use case doesn't need to do any type conversion here. The repository would change this to a flow. And then in our demo task list repository here, this returns the flow. Oh, well, I guess this, um, huh. Well, now I can't fake my delay here anymore um, without making this suspending. This is actually, like, getting interesting here, like, hmm. I'm wondering if this will come to bite me later, because eventually... Even though my repository is returning a flow, it would need to change its ditch dispatcher at some point. So it's almost like we would inject a dispatcher into the repository when we're actually inside the flow builder, you have a coroutine scope. Yeah, but I need to inject that somehow, right? Um, let's see, what can we do for now? We can do return flow... Um, the type emit result that success tax. So that's like the quick way to get this compiling again. Um, but I don't think this quite fixes it, right? Because so this works, but then I almost I need to put like the flow somewhere at the class level so that here when I modify our tasks. I'm actually going to like readmit. Um, and I don't know how to do that. Let's see if we can find. Oh, wait. How to emit flow value from a different function. Someone has an idea here. Oh, they recommend the state flow. I mean, I guess that seems kind of like, I don't know if this is technically correct here, but like, they're not wrong, right? Um, uh, we could make this immutable state flow task. Um, oh, this is considered a hot flow? 
Um, so then here we return tasks flow. Oh uh, wait. Well, I guess we could do. Um, we could just map this to a success result. Uh, but then here, so then here we could just like. Task load at value equals task. And this isn't great. This isn't, this probably isn't optimal, but it doesn't have to be. This is called demo task list repository for a reason. I just want something that can demo managing and emitting a list of tasks for app sake. So um, let's try it out. I'm still curious. Now, if it doesn't work again, I will need to look into the dagger configuration a little bit. Um, but let's let's just see what happens. Something about Coke and a glass bottle just hits different. That was so good. Okay, so we've got tasks one to ten. Um, Oop. Okay, it did not emit. Um, if I rotate, that shouldn't change anything, but oh god, I'm all messed up. Okay, so... Um... So what I was wondering then, right, so that was going to be what I wanted to look into when I said about the dagger hilt integration. Um, let's look at our repository module. Ooh, so this is singleton component, bind task list repository. Interesting. But it didn't. Okay, so let's add some logging here. Uh, does the bind also need singleton? I don't know. Um, I guess if we want to find out if it's being... I guess one way we could find out if it's being created multiple times is we could put like in... And at black, we could do log. We could add this. Um, I'm also going to just do this hacky thing again for now. Um, I'm going to remove that. I'm going to make the path list screen our start destination just so I can skip the login screen while I test this. I need to, I should just do a stream where we like cache login info so I can like have it as if it was actually working um, and I wouldn't have to keep changing my start destination every time I wanted to tweak this. Okay, ah, so let's look at our logs real quick. Um, Okay, so we created and we processed tasks. Okay, so we go here. Oop. Okay, it did. It created, it created the repository twice. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so why? Um, let's look at our modules again. So our use case module is also a singleton component and it uses the spines function. So you wanted to try, 
that we might need to annotate at singleton if we actually want it to be a singleton. See if they talk about that in the docs. Got it. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So I think singleton component means it's... So for each Android class in which you perform field injection, there's an associated component that can refer to the install in... Well, so it means it's like injected for application. See, okay, so Hilt automatically creates and destroys instances of generated component classes following the lifecycle of the corresponding Android classes. Interesting. Huh. So by default, all bindings in Hilt are unscoped. This means that each time your app... Okay, here we go. We have info. This means that each time your app requests the binding, Hilt creates a new instance of the needed type. In the example, every time Hilt provides analytics adapter as a dependency to another type or through field injection, Hilt provides a new instance of analytics adapter. However, Hilt also allows a binding to be scoped to a particular component. Hilt only, creates a, Hilt only creates a scoped binding once per instance of the component that that binding is scoped to, and all requests for that binding share the same instance. The table below lists scope annotations for each generated component. So wait, so this is why I was confused. If So that we instantiate the singleton DB in the application class, it should be only once, no? Well, right, so... I feel like this is giving me conflicted information here. Um, whoops. I zoomed in way too much. So. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, so it starts off by saying all bindings are unscoped. This means that each time your app requests the binding, he'll create a new instance of the needed type. That sounds good. That sounds like that's what we are seeing. But then it goes on to say it allows binding to be scoped to a particular component. So Hilt only creates a scope binding once per instance of the component that it's scoped to. So, right, so if I put at singleton here, then it sounds like this will only create one instance of this uh, per application. But what, so then what is this? Like, why doesn't install in automatically do that for me? Why do I need to also specify it here? Uh, and I think that's what I don't understand. Suppose the analytic service has an internal state that requires the same instance to be used every time, not only in example activity, but anywhere in the app. In this case, it is appropriate to scope analytic service to the singleton component. The result is that whenever the component needs to provide an instance, it will provide the same one every time. The following example demonstrates how to scope a binding to a component in a Hilt module. A binding scope must match the scope of the component where it is installed. So in this example, you must install analytic service in a singleton component instead of activity component. Interesting. Okay, yeah, so they still use this. But then I guess I'm just... But I guess I just don't entirely understand what install in does.
but that could just be my misunderstanding. Okay, but we added singleton, so let's try this then. So here, we take this. Mm, meep. Okay, and that worked. Because now we actually have a singleton for this. Uh, I'm wondering why the keyboard isn't closing. Um, I feel like that should have happened automatically. Uh, we could play around with that, but... Okay, but that works. Um, Ta-da! We can add a task to our demo repository. Let's get rid of our logging. Um, we can get rid of this log. Let's say, um, making repo a singleton, supporting, consuming a flow of tasks. Nice. This is actually uh, this is actually pretty good. Okay. So cool. We got through adding a task. So I did say I was gonna stream for an hour and a half, but we're at an hour and it's kind of good stopping point. So I wonder if we just keep tonight's stream kind of short. Um, yeah, I guess, but it sounds like I have, it sounds like if I don't add, if I don't add this, then it's going to make a new one every time. But then what is this? What? What's the, I don't know. Uh, like, what is the module being installed in? Like, why is that necessary? Um, for each Android... Yeah, no, we're not going for four hours, because I made plans. Uh, so, For each Android class in which you can perform field injection, there's an associated hilt component that you can refer to in the install and annotation. I think maybe, okay, so is it fair to say that, like, install in just tells me the possible scopes that this could be in? Like, if I made this, say, activity component, right, but then I try to, in an application, consume the repository module, would that not work? Would it say repositories can only be used with inside, inside an application lifetime? Or within an app activity lifetime? Right, so within an activity, it's going to make a new one every time, but this install in, it's like limiting where this dependency can be consumed in the first place. Is that how I could think about it? Does that make sense, or did I confuse everybody? Okay. Hmm. But if so, if I say this is scoped to the activity, or scope to the application. Sorry. If I say this is scope to the application, um, I kind of interpreted this as I would get one of these per application. But it sounds like that's not true. Or we, well, we know that's not true. We witnessed it. Um, so I have to use this if I say I only want one of these in this scope. But then I don't understand what the purpose of the scope is, I guess. Yeah. But even if it wasn't, I mean, I guess... Yeah.
But then what's its purpose? Like... Like, for all intents and purposes, you know, what's the difference between these two lines? Like, what, what's the difference? So, if I'm five, how do you explain a scope? Like, because I thought a scope meant sort of, like, the lifetime of the dependency. Oh, I mean, I guess maybe that's, maybe that's still true. So the scope being how long something can live, how long that reference is maintained, which is different from saying how many of these references are created, right? Again, it's like the wording is like very subtle to me. And like, I think I'm understanding it. I'm just having a hard time explaining it. Okay, you're right. Not necessarily how many, but like, but I guess that's what I think, like one versus a new one every time versus there might even be other ways. You're right. Okay. 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 Actually, let's. Okay. Now that we've said that, there's headlines in here for lifetimes and scopes. Let's go through the docs together real quick. Maybe this will make a little more sense when we talk about it together. Okay, so it's talking about these components, but here. So, Hilt automatically creates and destroys instances of generated component classes following the life cycle of the corresponding Android classes. So, if we say install in the singleton component, those generated classes are created and destroyed based on our acti application lifecycle or based on the activity lifecycle. And here it shows where it's at. But then scopes, got it. Okay, so scopes is different. Okay, you're right. I kind of see it now. One is sort of like, I don't know how to explain if this is the right words, but sort of like how long this reference will be maintained after it's created and when that reference is destroyed. And the scope kind of refers to, like, um, how it's created when it's request. Like, what do we do when it's been requested? Do we make a new one? Do we use one that's already been created? Um, got it. Okay. Okay. Right. Interesting note here. Scoping a binding to a component can be costly because the provided object stays in memory until that component is destroyed. Minimize the use of scoped bindings in your application. It is appropriate to use component scoped bindings for bindings with an, inter an internal state that requires that the same instance be used within a certain scope. For bindings that need synchronization, or for bindings that you have measured to be expensive to create. Okay. So, like an analytics service that maintains stuff. Hi, Illustrator. Uh, that maintains stuff throughout. I think this is good. Dependency injection is complicated. Like, this gets complicated, but I think the more I do it, the more I start to understand it a little better. Right. Uh, 
Um, but this component hierarchy was a thing that I tried to understand too. And that like, you have this sort of tree of possible components that like can only go into each other. So if I have a module and I put it say, you know, activity component, then I can't reference it up here inside like the application if I wanted to. Um, but I don't know how often people would like want to do that or something. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of benefits to like a manual dependency injection approach. Um, because it's like one of the, so I watched Sam Edwards give a talk on uh, do-it-yourself dependency injection. And one thing he talked about is um, do-it-yourself dependency injection is a lot easier for newer developers to understand because they can right-click and hit find usages. You can't do that with Hilt, right? So someone who's very new to Android comes into this project and they want to know, like, um, I don't know, this, where do we go? This get all task use case. They want to know which repository is used. And if I do find usages here, um, I guess where do we see? Well, okay, I guess there's usages and generated code, but that's got its own like confusion that people aren't going to love, right? So, actually, is this even going to work? Yeah, like this is its whole thing. So it's not like it's magic. Um, and magic isn't a bad thing. It's just like, how do we explain the magic that these libraries do? Um, that's why actually for a long time, I didn't like any library that used annotation processing. Um, no offense to you, Raphael, but it was a personal thing. Like I was so confused by all of these. I didn't like writing code that was doing things that I couldn't understand. It took me a long time to like start to wrap my mind around what some of that work was. Um, but, you know, like, that's that's my whole thing. And I think that's why I was afraid of Hilt for so long. Um, um, but yeah, I think that was fun. Uh, I think we'll keep it as a short stream. Um, I still got like a little bit of packing to do for my trip tomorrow. Uh, I will hydrate for Mohit before I go though. Cheers, Mohit. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yeah, let's just switch back. We'll talk. Thanks for hanging out for that short stream. I'll get this up on YouTube, uh, soon so people can watch it. It'll be nice. It'll be a refresher to have a non three hour YouTube video. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for like all the support this year. It has been a lot of fun streaming this year. And we've built a lot of cool stuff, both in the application we're working on now and other streams we've done in the past. I appreciate everyone who always feeds me ideas on things to talk about and share about on here. Don't stop doing that. Um, when we come back next year, we've I've already got like a list of exciting things to talk about and work on. So more cool stuff coming down the line.